I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby, and I am here with the director of the Disney Plus series, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Kari Skogland. And Kari, you know, it's common in TV to have directors pop in just for a couple episodes or one episode, which you've done uh, many times in your career. But now with this one, you've gotten to uh, do the entire season of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. What does it feel like and how is that different for you to execute your vision across the entire season? Well, uh, one of the things that really attracted me about this project, besides, you know, the, the, just the content, being able to tell this story of the first Black Captain America, was being able to tell the whole story. Because uh, as you said, popping in and out means it's very difficult to author it. Uh, and this really wanted to have an author because it was such a complex story with so many moving parts that to carve it up in advance into a few different brains was gonna be, I think, um, uh, not as healthy for the project as having you know, the one team, the core team taking it from beginning to end. Um, you know, it's, it, it's kind of the equivalent of having a lead actor that changes every couple of weeks, right? You know, you, you, um, you get inside the DNA of a project and then you understand it. We were also shooting it like a movie. So we had a movie schedule, which means we shot everything, you know, to do with Louisiana, for example. Then we went to another location, kind of shot out that location, block shooting. So um, it meant that we were informed by what happened uh, in one location. We were informed, oh, okay, now that, you know, the little magic that comes out of any, any, um, any scene that uh, no matter how scripted, you hope that some magic will happen that you didn't expect. And so once you know what that is, you then can apply it to what's coming that hasn't been shot yet that might happen before, blah, blah, blah. So it's a big puzzle. And um, I think it was really positive, certainly for me, um, to have that whole puzzle in my head every day. And you mentioned, you know, such a main story thread in here is Sam's hesitancy to take on the Captain America mantle and what that will mean uh, for him as a black man and for society. Um, was that always, uh, that thread always at the heart of the story? And what was important for you to tell there? Because it ended up being very prescient and timely. Well, yes, it was always the heart of the story. Um, and we, we knew long before the events, the pandemic or any of the following ensuing events uh, happened, we were on that, that particular path, which just only goes to say that that story and, and that discussion is long overdue and is maybe ongoing. And um, it's certainly not the first time it's been discussed, but certainly the first time in this particular context. So um, what I, from the beginning, you know, I, I said in my very first presentation of the gang, when, you know, you go in and you kind of uh, tell them your ideas and how you're gonna, what you're thinking in terms of the execution and, and the themes and all that. From the very beginning, I said, this is the most important story of the century. And I really knew that in my DNA. And um, the, the other thing I felt that was really important to talk about was what is a hero today? Because that's another major theme um, that goes alongside the Black Captain America, which is if from you know the comics, which were born of the 30s and 40s, that was a paradigm of a soldier warrior and a, a white, uh, certainly a, a white iconic symbol, which is you know a metaphor for the flag, um, and so that seemed very outdated to me because really it was about what is a hero today. And a hero today is not a warrior soldier entirely. It is also a first responder uh, or a frontline worker. And so that needed to be expanded and explored and what that shield meant to every different person, the John Walker who looked the part, but sort of has an imposter syndrome going on and he doesn't have what it takes because there's some inside flaws that he, he's still struggling with. Uh, he doesn't really know who he is. Um, to Bucky, it meant something else. Also someone who's damaged and who's trying to find his own relevance to, to the, the planet and to, the, um, uh, to his future. Uh, Sharon Carter meant something else too. You know, uh, even, even Carly 
it meant something very different to on the international scene. So we really tried to encompass these bigger themes um, all in that same discussion of what it, what it was for a black man to pick up this white iconic symbol. And was that symbol relevant? Not just to the black man, but to every, everyone. What, should it be locked up? And that was, you know, I think at its core and a, an incredibly interesting conversation to have in the form of a drama. Yeah, I think one of the um, most shocking moments, uh, maybe in all of Marvel, is what happens with that symbol when John Walker uses it to murder somebody uh, with the, the shield. Um, could you just talk about what, how did you approach constructing that sequence? I don't, I, I remember thinking, oh, I can't believe Marvel's gone there. Fantastic. That's exactly what we wanted to do. I mean, one of the wonderful things about working with Marvel is they never back off. They, they really, they, they um, push the envelope, want you to push the envelope. Uh, and, and for the sake of the story, it's, it's never for shock value. It's, it's really for the, pertinent to the, to the narrative that you're talking. Um, so for, you know, to construct that, of course, it was months and months of thought and um, planning across the board. So we had the, not just the story of it, but then you have the action sequence that you have to map out, find the locations that are gonna work, adjust things for the locations. We drew the sequence uh, through storyboards. Uh, we did not what's called previs, which they, which often they do because by then we, we were more into the board stage of, <laughs> we were running out of time, I guess. Um, but we found this great location because I wanted that action sequence to feel more like a horror movie than a traditional action sequence. So we went to a creepy place and, um, you know, it was full of sounds and sort of weirdness so that already our character was kind of thrown off. Um, by then, of course, we, uh, we discover that he's taken the serum and uh, we've gone through that process with him. So we know he's kind of a different animal already. Um, so he goes in, so that whole sequence needs, needed to feel like it was somehow off kilter so that when he then loses it, we go inside his head and that was very planned as well. We decided what the last shot wanted to be and we were very you know, structured about that. But what I wanted to experiment with was how to get to that moment so that it's either one swift move or is it kind of we go into his head and it's a sort of a, a ballet of of altered time uh and so we shot we did shoot some um you know i want to call it just inspirational footage uh using different equipment things like the phantom which does super super slow-mo uh and uh, you know above and beyond what a traditional camera can do um and why it gave it his all and uh so we then through editing and that's, I love to shoot for the editing room because I feel like that's when you get to redirect the movie, the scene, the, you know, the characters. And so in the editing room, we um, have, a, have a brilliant editor and he, um, uh, by the name of Jeff, and he is, uh, he brought it together and we never really touched it. Once he had it and he created this in incredible sequence, I, I don't think we adjusted anything. It just fell into place. Yeah. Um... Well, I, I also wanted to go back to some of those characters you mentioned before, because so many people in this story are occupying this moral gray area, or they are villains, but you can feel for them or see their point. Um, like you understand um, John Walker's frustration, and you can see that Zemo has some points, or Sharon has some points, because she has ulterior motives. When you're dealing with characters that are so uh, in that gray area, is it difficult to keep the mystery there and not shade them towards one side? How do you approach that with the acting? Well, it, you know, you're talking radicalism. The, the idea was to, I, I've done a lot of uh, research into radicalism and um, I've done other projects where I've sort of dug deep. And one of the things about um, extremism is that it is a slippery slope. So you start, you know, the, the, the rhetoric is not entirely inaccurate or unfair or you know it, it starts with a small kernel of some kind of truth which you can bite into it's what you do with that information and how it then turns and what you how you act and whether or not you become violent and 
and it turns against uh, what you actually started out to, to do. You know, if it's a, if you started out in as an act of peace, where does it suddenly go wrong that suddenly you're a violent, your acts toward peace, trying to get peace are violent, you know, it becomes distorted. So um, that was what we wanted to explore in each of those, uh, those characters. I wanted to see Zemo uh, much more understand him uh, because, you know, a, a two dimensional villain is, uh, it becomes very dull very quickly. Carly was the most interesting to me because she uh, was so, you know, fresh faced and a Robin Hood and at her core wanting to do the right thing. Um, and, you know, says to save people. And it starts to go sideways when she, her anger overcomes her good sense, her, her moral compass, uh, because her, her surrogate mother dies, which is understandable. It doesn't mean it's acceptable. So same with John Walker. We understand why he lost his mind. It's not acceptable and he needs to be punished for it. And, uh, but, but we at least understand where it came from, that it came from a flawed insight so that, that he, he, this imposter syndrome where he, he couldn't be what he hoped he, he, he wanted to be. Same with Zemo. So Zemo, I wanted to get a little bit inside him for all of his heinous acts there was a human in there who had children. And um, what did that mean? Where did that anger take him? And so, you know, and, and how did that distort his perspective of the world? And yet he says a lot of wise things about elitism and extremism and how, you know, he just, the way he, he wants to stop it is draconian. But Sam, by comparison, wants to harness it. He's trying desperately to make sense of it and to, you know, get that energy back on side, get it on track, understand it, not try to combat it like the old, the old guard does, you know, combat, destroy and kill. He wants to try to somehow understand it and bring it in, you know, talk her off the ledge and bring her somehow into the, into a realm where it can be addressed because she's not entirely wrong. So those are the, all the different ways we wanted to explore each each one of those lanes of elitism or extremism, uh, radicalism, all, all the isms in one big package. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, another thing that happened while you were shooting is that this pandemic that we're, we're hopefully nearing the end of soon uh, halted production and so much that the, the release schedule was shifted. And what, what was that like when you had to halt and we're in this in-between period. Did you re-examine everything? What was it like just kind of being on hold? Well, we uh, never were really on hold because what we did was we just pivoted to post. We had shot about 75% of um, the show. So we were well into it um, when we had to shut down. What it afforded us because we, um, it was amazing, the team very quickly geared up and we were working remotely, which nobody had really worked remotely in that kind of scale uh, before. Certainly, I don't think at Disney, we'd all worked remotely in, in little you know pockets for sure. But now we had to you know imagine the show in a much bigger scale without being in the room with anybody. Um, so uh, that was pretty extraordinary. And we, within three weeks, we were up and right at it. So then all the editors, we had a total of four editors at that point, um, started, you know, we just started working and working each scene and each show. And we had 75%. So we were able to really kind of see all six episodes for the most part and, uh, and see where the holes were, obviously. Um, and also move it, you know, you, you tend to, when you're making a movie like that, because we sort of made a six part, a, a six part movie, six hour movie, we were able to, to juggle those, you know, you, you sort of um, move the deck around and you look at, oh, well, that scene actually might work better here. Or, you know, the ending of that episode, maybe we want to do here and then move that, you know, so you, we did a little bit of that experimenting as one does. And by the time we had finished that and we were coming back on, on, on track, we really knew what we were going to shoot. I mean, we, we were laser focused. We knew the characters. If John Walker, he was the most unrendered, I think, in that we were still looking, you know, we were experimenting quite a bit with, with Wyatt's performance, uh, calibrating it, sometimes a little funnier, sometimes a little more earnest, sometimes 
um, you know, a little more um, angry, whatever, because we were still searching for it. But by the time we'd finished that, that sort of 75% edit, we knew exactly who he was. And so we were able to come back and really tar be targeted. The, sh the story didn't change, but we did sharpen our pencil. Yeah. Well, um, before I have to let you go, I, I, you have such a vast uh, resume here in TV and you've worked on a lot of genre television, uh, you know, shows that have a really rich uh, world and lore to them, but also have a very strong, I think, socio-political sense. I mean, you're an Emmy nominee for Handmaid's Tale. Uh, you've done things like The Walking Dead or or Vikings. And what is it about those really uh, those really rich worlds that speak to you as a director and, and get your creative juices flowing? Well, I think you've said it. They always have some kind of a political context that allows me to make, you know, embed a statement, a little bit of vitamins in the ice cream. Um, and I look for that because I, I also love history. Um, and so a lot of my projects like the Borgias or even Boardwalk Empire um, look at, you know, a historical context. And I always feel like history informs the present and certainly the, you know, the, the potential of the future. You, 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 it's a sort of a seamless through line. Uh, and the more you understand about the past, the more you can um, aim for a, a future of choosing. So I guess I look, and I also love to do deep research. So, so that I, you know, uh, I, uh, God is in the details and I love to find those details and, and exploit them, um, which I think those kinds of shows um, that's what they are. They're really all about the details. I mean, I guess everything is, but uh, in particular, those ones seem to be um, so rich. And then performance. It, the, every one of those shows, the actors are, um, are embraced to do, and, and the writing is so strong that they are able to give it their best. Loudest voice. I mean, Russell just kicked it out of the park. That was near history. It was very interesting to look at that period of time through a modern day lens. And, and that informs us of where we are, where we were, where we might be going. So um, I guess if that answers that question, uh, it's all, all of the above, all of that big, um, big sandbox of uh, toys I get to play with. Yes, well, we can't, uh, can't wait to see what's next for, for your sandbox. So thank you, thank you so much uh, for sitting down with me. If you're watching, make sure you subscribe to Gold Derby and Kari, thank you once again. Thank you.